All right, looks like we're stabilizing at 19, so uh, might as well get started. Thank you, everybody, for connecting today for this Enfold seminar. We're really good to see you all. Enfold is the network for life detection. It's one of the uh, several research coordination networks that the NASA Astro, Astro, NASA Astro Valley Program organize, organizes. And this one in particular is uh, designed to bring together technologists and scientists in thinking about ways to look for life elsewhere and how to look for life elsewhere and what to look for life, um, what to look for. And so uh, today we're very excited to welcome Dr. Chris Greening of Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Hence the different time of the seminar uh, this month. I will go back uh, depending on our, where our next speaker is from to the 10 a.m. U.S. Pacific time slot. But today, um, because of the Australia constraints, uh, thank you, Chris, for waking up early. I think you're willing to chat with us today on atmospheric trace gases, hidden energy sources enabling extreme life. Chris, thank you again, and the floor is yours. That's, that's great. Thanks so much, um, Sandra, for the fantastic introduction. And uh, thanks also for Roland, who can't be here today for actually um, facilitating my um, involvement in, in, in this um, seminar. Um, so I, I'll say up front that um, my background is as a microbiologist who knows um, very little about astrobiology. So I've always been interested about this, but I have essentially um, no formal training in, in that area. So what I really hope to do today is actually get your um, feedback on some of um, these findings that we've made as to how relevant you think they are for astrobiology and how we might be able to take some of these findings to the, to the next level and whether there's actually opportunities for any collaborations and, and so forth as well. And what I'm gonna be focusing on is um, atmospheric trace gases and how the atmosphere, which we normally think of a source of um, carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and things, it's actually also a source of energy um, for, for life, um, specifically microbial life. And um, to illustrate this, I just used this image from the Namib Desert in Namibia. So here you can clearly see there's no animals around, or at least um, no obvious animals around. Um, the plant or the tree is dead. Um, but if you go into um, each um, gramma soil here, usually you find numerous microorganisms in the, this soil. And this, um, these microorganisms are living on vegetation not generally living by photosynthesis. Instead, it turns out that they're primarily living on this thing right here, the atmosphere, which is this hidden reservoir of energy. And we think in turn this has some implications for finding life um, outside Earth um, and, and in turn um, also some ramifications for planetary protection, but I'll let you, you be the good uh, judge of that. So um, through my lab, often through um, these weird and wonderful collaborations that have emerged, we've ended up looking at a whole range of extreme environments and seeing how life basically exists there. So these go from right away from deserts to caves um, to um, sediments, and, and uh, we're starting to get into the atmosphere itself, including uh, with a couple of people on the, on the Zoom call today. Um, and um, in each of these environments, they present um, unique um, pressures for microorganisms. So in deserts, of course, the major thing is the low availability of water, whereas in caves, let's say it's primarily the aphotic conditions, whereas in sands, which we wouldn't normally think of extreme environments for microbes because they're constantly transitioning from um, light oxic to dark and oxic states, it's actually quite a stressful environment to be in and so forth. But nonetheless, microbes have found a way in each of these ecosystems. Actually, there's usually a, a, a very large both quantity as well as diversity of microorganisms in each of these environments. And uh, this reflects that they all have different metabolic capabilities. And um, rather than being the metabolic capabilities that people would normally learn about from textbooks, usually you find in these environments often chemosynthesis. So the ability to fix carbon, um, and generate energy from chemical energy sources, including inorganic ones, tends to be really dominant in many of these environments. And uh, this reflects that basically bacteria are far more um, versatile than we are um, in terms of their metabolic capabilities. And this is really illustrated by the Winograssi column. 
to some extent. Um, so unlike ourselves, who were dependent, of course, on organic foods, um, as we were talking about preferings earlier, but they certainly um, don't really exist. Um, but um, for bacteria, they're actually capable of um, doing far more um, than just using organic foods. So many of them are capable of using gases like hydrogen. They can also use various other compounds like ammonium, sulfide, iron. They can degrade pollutants too. And of course, some of them are capable of using sunlight um, either to fix carbon or in some cases just to conserve energy. And of course, bacteria aren't just restricted to oxygen either, like we are. Um, they can actually grow anaerobically using everything from um, carbon dioxide, in the case of methanogens and acetogens, by the way, through to nitrate, sulfate, iron, organohalides, and, and many, many other things. And of course, many microbes are capable of uh, sustained fermentation too, so we can ferment, but we have to recycle the end products, whereas microbes can just excrete those end products into their environment. And this diversity of um, metabolic strategies is um, obvious if you compare different microorganisms, but it's also um, this diversity is also reflected within microbes, if that makes sense. So many microorganisms are versatile. So some are capable of switching from growing on organic compounds to say doing photosynthesis and um, or doing hydrogen oxidation either alternately or simultaneously. And um, many organisms can actually switch from using aerobic respiration to anaerobic respiration to fermentation. E. coli is just one example of that. And where I really want to focus my attention today is um, Antarctic life. Um, I'll be talking about a range of things, but much of it comes back to Antarctica, where we've made some of these um, discoveries. Um, and this is um, a picture from one of our field sites in the McKay Glacier region, taken by a collaborator in Hogg. And if you look at um, this environment, you would um, probably I'm speaking to the converted, but to many audiences, they wouldn't think this much. Um, life there. Um, but actually, if you um, do molecular methods rather than culture-based methods, there's actually hundreds of bacterial species, millions of cells, usually in every single gram of this soil. So back in the 70s, everyone, uh, the leading ecologists in this field basically said, Antarctica is a sterile continent or more or less sterile continent, but this is clearly not the case. Um, and yet there's tons of life there, but it's um, persisting um, probably rather than primarily growing, there's at least some probably turnover of, of, of material. So the conditions of Antarctica are of course quite harsh. So we're talking obviously freezing temperatures, but also really low um, bioavailable water, often high um, salinity, and um, also the seasonality of Antarctica where you go from summers with intense never-ending um, UV radiation to polar winters where there's no light at all. And these conditions essentially um, restrict um, phototrophs, which mediate photosynthesis, so the capture of light energy and using that to fix um, carbon dioxide into biomass. Um, and therefore, that means that through photosynthesis, there's not going to be much carbon available um, to sustain these communities, yet there are communities there. So this indicates there must be something missing. And I think you already know the answer to what's missing, and that, again, is, is the atmosphere. But to give some, um, some background here, here is um, from a, a recent study um, in PNES that, that we published, but it builds on an earlier study um, from a few years ago, um, where basically what we did here was take soils from the McKay Glacier region, the ice-free um, soils here, and then we did what's called um, metagenomics, which is essentially taking soil or any other um, whole sample, extracting all the DNA from that soil, then um, from there, analyzing the DNA and also reconstructing genomes from that DNA, as opposed to the conventional method of genomics, which, be, which would be to isolate an organism and then um, sort of, uh, sequence the genome of that. And so um, in the heat map here, it shows a range of soils on the x-axis. And then you've got here different genes that do different metabolic processes. And at the bottom are the determinants of phototrophy, so um, using light energy for um, either carbon fixation or alternatively um, just energy conservation. And you can see that generally the, the capacity for phototrophy is pretty low with a couple of exceptions. Whereas when you start to look at lifeic compounds, so compounds that are in the rocks like sulfide or ammonium, 
we start to see that there's a fair bit of capacity, but where the communities are um, have a particularly high capacity is in this um, process of um, trace gas oxidation. So we see that two different hydrogenase enzymes, so these are the enzymes that convert hydrogen into protons and electrons, and the electrons can be used um, for aerobic respiration. Um, there's um, plenty of hydrogenases there, about 90% of the community encodes hydrogenases. Um, carbon monoxide oxidation as mediated by carbon monoxide dehydrogenases is also really abundant too. And for a couple of communities, um, methane oxidation is important too. So not as, not as widespread, um, but the single most abundant organism in, in um, this region was actually a methanotroph, so an organism that can grow aerobically using methane. And we didn't just stop there, we actually validated for activity measurements that hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and at these um, three sites, um, methane um, were all being used by these communities at significant rates um, under aerobic conditions. So the question, of course, is where are they getting this hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and methane? And generally, when people think of hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and microbes, um, they generally would think about environments where these um, gases are locally enriched due to whether that be fermentation or, or nitrogen fixation or geothermal processes. But actually, in Antarctic communities, they are capable of using um, the hydrogen, carbon monoxide, methane available purely at atmospheric concentrations. So again, when we think of the atmosphere, we know, of course, it's essential for life, um, at least um, high life. Um, as the source of carbon dioxide for carbon fixation, and nitrogen gas for nitrogen fixation, and um, oxygen for aerobic respiration. But until literally about a, a decade ago, it was never really thought about as a source of energy, at least on Earth. Um, but there is a little bit of energy available in the atmosphere, despite its overall oxidizing state. And this energy is mainly in the form of hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and methane, which are available in um, around about parts per million um, concentrations in the atmosphere. Methane is the most abundant, about uh, two parts per million and increasing. Um, and this is a little bit harder to use than hydrogen carbon monoxide, which are less abundant, um, a little bit more um, um, readily accessible to microbes, um, just reflecting that methane has to be um, activated through um, an, an oxidation reaction first, whereas hydrogen carbon monoxide can essentially be used by microbes as is. And in the case of hydrogen carbon monoxide, um, even at these low concentrations, they turn out to be incredibly useful for microbes, at least when there's not much else there. And this is for three main reasons. So even at these low concentrations, they yield plenty of energy. So we all know from hydrogen power cars or whilst the Hindenburg disaster, that if you react hydrogen with oxygen, that releases plenty of energy. And these microbes have evolved ways to do this in a way that they are actually using this energy to perform biologically useful work. So they're making ATP and fixing carbon from that. Um, the, um, another advantage is that these gases are passively diffusing into cells. And in the case of hydrogen carbon monoxide can be activated very, very readily unlike say organic carbon in Antarctic soils, which um, needs some active transport to be taken up and also would usually be um, in some sort of frozen state often. And the other key advantage of course with these trace gases is that they're ubiquitous. So they're the, one of the few really um, dependable things in these ecosystems. So um, uh, carbon is going to be a, a variable in its concentration and it's usually going to be quite inaccessible whereas trace gases are continually going to be there, albeit low concentrations. And so by just continually guzzling these, these gases, these microorganisms can find um, a way to, to exist. And so what I hope to convince you is that life really doesn't need um, photosynthesis to prosper on Earth, and therefore it probably doesn't necessarily on other planets either. So of course, photosynthesis on most ecosystems on Earth is either directly or indirectly is driving most things that are going on. But of course, in the 1970s, um, there were these incredible discoveries of hydrothermal vents um, where there's very complex um, communities present. And this is all dependent on chemosynthesis, not photosynthesis, where hydrogen, sulfides, and so forth coming from um, um, the, uh, coming uh, from geological sources 
is actually powering carbon fixation by the microorganisms present there. Many of these microorganisms live in symbiosis with things like these um, tube worms shown here. And this actually allowed, that allows quite complex um, communities to exist. And then we have this other example, which I think is a whole new way to basically have an ecosystem exist again, which is using the atmosphere as an energy source. And you're not getting the same remarkably lush communities as you can see here, but you do, if you look at these soils, find plenty of microorganisms um, present, and these are living on the hydrogen carbon monoxide, methane found in the atmosphere. And this is a really new concept, which I think is um, pretty relevant for um, life outside Earth. Um, and, but I'll let you be, be the judge of that. So um, I think it has ramifications for the minimal requirements for life. Um, and um, in turn, when we're thinking about life on other planets, whether that be Mars or far, far outside um, our solar system, um, we possibly should be thinking a little bit less about following the water from the perspective of photosynthesis at least, and much more about actually looking about um, whether there are gases there that could be potentially um, sustaining um, communities instead. Um, keeping in mind that, as I'll talk about a little bit later, for using these gases, some of these microorganisms are actually able to generate plenty of water as a solvent um, to exist. And uh, before I go on, a, uh, before I go on any further, I really wanted to say a few thank yous. Um, the first is um, to the diverse team that's um, working in my um, lab in, in, um, in Monash, Australia, uh, Monash University, Australia. Um, so I'm really fortunate to um, host such a brilliant, innovative, but also very, very nice team of people. But I also want to thank um, mentors like um, Greg Cook, my PhD supervisor, um, our various collaborators across the world who have really broadened my mind, but also other really fantastic scientists who are working in the space, especially um, Philippe Constant and Carrie King, who've made really important findings that are inspirational to me in the hydrogen and carbon monoxide spaces, respectively. So um, this is how I'm gonna break down my talk today. I've given a little bit of introduction already, and I'm gonna start off by talking about the cellular basis of all of this and how we discovered this process. Then I'm gonna move on to talk about the ecological importance before finally touching a little bit on the astrobiological implications. So um, these discoveries were all actually originally made in um, pure culture. So I was working on an organism called Mycobacterium somatis, which is usually uh, used as a model system for understanding tuberculosis. And my hope was to um, actually make really medically um, profound findings. I've completely failed to do that, but I actually made some surprising findings that were actually very useful um, for understanding um, ecology and biogeochemistry and possibly astrobiology as well. And the reason we use mycobacterium is that it's one of the most hardy bacteria known. Um, it, it can basically live pretty much indefinitely um, on, um, amid a range of physical and chemical stresses. And um, the dogma of this bacterium that's been around for about um, 100 years is that this bacterium strictly requires organic carbon and oxygen. So just like our cells, it's electron transport chain, it's respiratory chain. Um, the only known inputs, um, at least before we came along, were from organic carbon and oxygen. But what we've known also is that this bacterium can live literally for years without either. And to me, that didn't make sense. This seemed like a contradiction. And we thought there was something missing. You know what was missing, but I'll, I'll show you the evidence for that. So um, we, to get some insights into this, um, we use both transcriptomics and proteomics to basically understand how gene expression of this bacterium changes during um, starvation for its preferred organic energy sources. So for those of you who aren't familiar with proteomics, that is basically taking a cell or environmental extract and then determining every protein that's there using a really powerful mass spectrometry tools. And um, this here is a volcano plot. It might look a bit intimidating, but it's actually fairly easy to understand. So every dot here is a protein of Mycobacterium spermatis, and everything on the left, at least on my screen, are proteins that are more abundant during the feast state. So that's when um, this Mycobacterium has um, plenty of organic carbon available, so it's preferred energy source. 
whereas everything on the right are proteins that are more abundant during starvation, so it's famine state. And what you can see here is that on the left, um, when plenty of organic carbon is available, I should expect the determinants of um, using organic carbon as both an energy and carbon source are really abundant. Um, and these include the two enzymes for glycerol utilization as expected, given glycerol was used as a sole energy and carbon source here. But on the right, this is where things get a little bit more interesting. We saw um, proteins that are typically associated with using inorganic compounds as being highly upregulated. So we saw two hydrogenases, um, so what are called HUC and HHY, um, shown here. Um, so these enzymes are what enables bacteria to, and, and archaea to um, use hydrogen as an energy source and break hydrogen into protons and electrons that are then funneled um, to um, oxygen or anaerobic electron acceptors. We also saw carbon monoxide um, dehydrogenase. So this is associated with, um, again, energy generation, carbon monoxide to CO2, and, uh, and this, again, releases electrons, and possibly the determinants of nitrate oxidation too, but we're not quite sure about this. And so this is suggesting that this bacterium is switching from somehow um, growing on organic carbon to doing either very slow growth or persistence on inorganic compounds um, when it's limited for this organic carbon. And we know that now that this switch is very tightly regulated, that there are process called catabolite repression, the sensor levels of organic carbon, and they'll only switch on these enzymes when organic carbon is low. And so what's happening? Well, it, it turns out that mycobacterium somatis can use um, hydrogen at really, really low concentrations, even though it was always traditionally thought to only be capable of using organic carbon as energy sources. And this was the landmark finding from my PhD in the lab of, of Greg Kack and uh, Rolf Conrad. Um, and here we took wild-type mycobacterium somatis, so the natively um, isolated organism, and we just measured hydrogen consumption in carbon-limited cells over time. And what you can see here is that in a first-order kinetic process, the wild-type um, bacterium quite rapidly consumes hydrogen, and this depends on two different hydrogenases, HUC and HHY, that if you delete, this process no longer happens. But the key thing is that these cells are oxidizing hydrogen well below this dotted line here. So that is the concentration of hydrogen on average in the atmosphere, so 0.53 parts per million. And so this is um, pretty amazing. This is the first genetic proof that a bacterium can actually um, use atmospheric hydrogen. And um, to me, it was a finding that was so utterly simple and obvious that I almost kicked myself for not thinking about this four years earlier into my PhD. But at the same time, it was something that no one, including myself, was ever really thinking about. No one was thinking about the atmosphere as an energy source. So here you have a flask of Mycobacterium somatis, um, aerobic conditions, and once it's ran out of all of the energy in its media, just as, as bacteria do, it's still actually taking up exogenous energy, but from the atmosphere um, instead, which whenever I tell people about this, I always get one of two reactions, and that is either that that's completely obvious or it's completely amazing. And for me, I, I would fall into both categories. It still blows my mind to a, to a large degree. And we see that this process is really important. So during phase flow growth of this bacterium in continuous culture, we see that the cells grow about 50% better when they consume atmospheric hydrogen. So this is findings from Michael Banny here. And then when we delete the hydrogenases and look at them under hypoxia, we see about a tenfold reduction in survival if they can't use any hydrogen at all, as shown um, by, the, that, by the purple here. So this indicates that these cells are productively using this hydrogen. They're not just oxidizing it for the sake of it, but they're actually using it to generate energy that they use for slow growth and survival. We see the same sort of thing when it comes to carbon monoxide. And this is beautiful work led by Katie Bailey and Paul Cordero. So quite simple, but very elegant work, at least in, in my biased opinion. Um, so here we see Mycobacterium somatis, again, is capable of using carbon monoxide and it oxidizes it below atmospheric concentrations. So for us, obviously, carbon monoxide is pretty toxic, for, but for microorganisms, many of them can use it, many of them can actually thrive on it. And this depends on the enzyme carbon monoxide dehydrogenase, which if we knock it out, this process no longer happens. This process stimulates respiration. So if you add carbon monoxide, you actually have a nice 
um, uh, amount of oxygen consumption indicating that the respiratory chain is working and ADP is being made. And in turn, if you delete the enzyme responsible, this reduces um, survival. So they don't need um, carbon monoxide dehydrogenase for detoxification. Instead, they actually need it to use carbon monoxide as an energy source for, for long-term survival. And we now have a good um, biochemical understanding of what's going on. So I won't, I won't bore you with the details here, but we now have very nice high resolution um, cryo-electron microscopy structures of both the HUC hydrogenase and the carbon monoxide dehydrogenase solved by David, um, Ash and Reese um, through incredible work from, from them. And what we know from looking at both the structures, but also from doing assays on the purified enzymes is that they directly couple the oxidation of atmospheric hydrogen and carbon monoxide to the reduction of menaquinones in the membrane. So for those of you who don't know what menaquinones are, these are sort of the funnels in the electron transport chain or respiratory chain of organisms that actually take the electrons from hydrogen and carbon monoxide in this case, um, all the way down to oxygen. And so taking a bit of a closer view of how mycobacteria basically um, live, um, during feast states, when there's plenty of organic carbon, that they behave very, very similar to what we do. So they take up organic carbon, they um, get the electrons from that organic carbon, um, and they transfer it to menaquinone and then to oxygen. And this downhill electron transfer powers the pumping of protons, which then enables ADP synthesis. So this is a classic process of respiration, aerobic respiration or chemiosmosis. Whereas in famine, what you're having is something that's much more minimalistic. It's probably not quite as um, a biphasic switch as what I'm showing here, but as they gradually run more and more out of carbon, the more and more dependent on these atmospheric trace gases. And these trace gases, unlike carbon, you don't need any energy to take them up. They theoretically just diffuse through the membrane. And there you have these special enzymes, HHY, HUC, which are then shown, and COX, and the carbon monoxide dehydrogenase which use these atmospheric trace gases, atmospheric hydrogen and carbon monoxide to release electrons that are used to directly reduce menaquinone to menaquinol. Um, and then these are then transferred to oxygen. This enables a little bit of proton pumping that powers ADP synthase. So a very simple mechanism that um, is nevertheless a very dependable one based on the thermodynamic calculations. Mycobacteria at levels of about 10 to 6 to 10 to 7 um, um, cells per mil can survive solely through this process. Um, so thankfully, this isn't just exclusive to um, mycobacterium. We've done genomic surveys of both the hydrogenase and carbon monoxide, and it's incredibly widespread in um, bacteria in a range of terrestrial and marine environments. And we've also shown experimentally that all of the following isolates are capable of using um, atmospheric H2, and this is primarily work of Sarah and Bob but um, several others as well. Um, and these are bacteria from a wide range of both phyla, but also um, physiologies and environments too. So it spans everything from, um, from um, psychophiles, so organisms that are from Antarctica, like Haminobacter, right the way through to hot spring isolates like Thermomicrobium, microbium, um, volcanic crater isolates of all things like Corinomonas, but also spans bacteria of a wide range of physiologies as well. So Mycobacterium somatis is um, an organism that primarily grows using organic carbon, whereas Acidify bacillus is primarily growing on sulfide and iron, at least based on um, conventional studies, nitrospira nitrite and uh, methyl acidophilum, um, methane. But all of these can actually use atmospheric hydrogen as well. And I should mention um, this fantastic work from uh, Philippe Constant in, 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 in uh, Canada, who simultaneously has shown that streptomyces spores are also capable of basically surviving indefinitely by using um, atmospheric hydrogen as well. So he made these findings um, just around the time I was doing my PhD, and that serves as a massive inspiration for me. So um, just as an example of this, I wanted to just mention Nitrospira moscoviensis specifically. So this is a bacterium that was once considered be an obligate nitrate oxidizer. So it grows by using nitrite as a source of energy, um, but also as a source of electrons for carbon fixation. And given nitrite is so oxidized already, this is a pretty hard lifestyle. But in collaboration with Holger Dames in Vienna, what we're able to show is that this bacterium is actually constitutively consuming atmospheric hydrogen. 
So whether it's using nitrite or not, they will always be using hydrogen. And this reflects again that hydrogen is just this amazing um, lifeline that nitrite's a tough lifestyle that will allow them to grow if there's plenty of um, nitrite available. But if not, they will either grow or persist on, on hydrogen instead. And if you look at the thermodynamics of this process, you see that at low substrate availabilities, the energy yield from atmospheric hydrogen is actually, uh, well, hydrogen, I should say, not necessarily atmospheric, but these are going towards atmospheric concentrations is far higher than the energy yield um, from nitrate oxidation, but high substrate concentrations, this shifts. So this indicates that in a ligotrophic environment, so environments where there's not much energy down, um, these bacteria, contrary to, um, to dogma, again, are primarily living on hydrogen, not, not nitrite. So this was very nice work um, led actually by Bob Lung in collaboration with Holga. And most recently, this is figured literally two weeks old. We've shown that some archaea can live on uh, too. So um, archaea is the third domain of life. Some of them are aerobic, many of them are anaerobic, and they also have the hydrogenases and carbon monoxide dehydrogenases to use um, atmospheric hydrogen and carbon monoxide too. And these include isolates from um, both acidic hot springs, um, acidianus in this case, but also um, salt lakes um, through the work of, of Gary King. Um, and I guess for many of you in the room, you'll be thinking everything I've talked to you about so far is regarding bacteria that can grow on or, or survive on oxygen. And obviously in exoplanets, oxygen is probably not going to be available or will be in very limiting conditions. But it turns out that there's increasing evidence trace gas oxidation can also occur under anoxic conditions. So it's been known for, for yonks that um, numerous anaerobic bacteria can consume hydrogen at elevated levels to do everything from sulfate reduction to um, methanogenesis to um, organohalide dechlorination and all, all of these, these sorts of processes. But it's actually certain aerobic bacteria can also consume atmospheric hydrogen using fumarate, as we showed in this paper, and more recently, we've observed probably nitrate is also being capable of uh, being used as electron acceptors. So theoretically, on an atmosphere of an exoplanet, it could be possible that um, certain organisms would be coupling the oxidation of atmospheric hydrogen to the reduction of things like fumarate, which probably isn't going to be there, or nitrate. But what's really um, relevant is this work from Gary King, um, where he showed that Various um, bacteria can anaerobically consume trace amounts of carbon monoxide, um, including these halophilic archaea, which I just mentioned. And these are able to do so using the oxidation by oxidizing CO in the presence of perchlorate. So perchlorate is quite an unusual electron acceptor, but it's something that's highly available together with carbon monoxide on Mars. And I think this has um, pretty major astrobiological implications. So I've talked um, quite a bit about the um, cellular basis of this process, and now I want to move on and talk about the ecological importance. Um, and so it turns out that trace gas oxidizers are pretty diverse and abundant across um, soils worldwide. So this is work led by Sean and Eleonora. And again, we did a combination of metagenomics with um, activity measurements. And in each of these environments, you can see that the and determinants of carbon monoxide and hydrogen oxidation are really, really abundant. And if you then take a genome resolved view, so you reconstruct metagenome assembled genomes, you see that these bacteria span at least 19 different phyla, including all of the major soil phyla. So this isn't, an, um, this isn't a, a minor process, this is a really major process. And soils worldwide. Um, and then if you go into the field, measure activities, concordant findings um, emerge. So this is shown in Wombat State Forest in Australia. The reason he has this um, umbrella isn't to protect him from the rain, but rather the intense um, Australian heat. And there he's just got this um, little flex chamber where he's measuring hydrogen and carbon monoxide consumption. And here you can see that within literally two minutes, all of the hydrogen and carbon monoxide is, is gone. And this isn't due to diffusion. We've got controls for this. It's actually due to biological activity, meaning that even in highly vegetated soils, you've got plenty of gas guzzlers there. And this process is um, when you take the soils back into lab, you can see it's predominating in the top soils, but normalized to biomass, even in deep soils, there's plenty of trace gas oxidation going on. And so what we have done is a combination of, um, 
of activity measurements with genomic potentials. And from that, you can actually do um, thermodynamic modeling to basically determine each cell that's um, capable of using um, these trace gases based on the activities we see, how much energy or how much power can they get from this? And this was um, done in collaboration with, with, with several people, um, including James Bradley. And um, what we saw um, here is that based on this, um, the levels of trace gas oxidation from this process is more than sufficient to, um, to meet the maintenance needs of these bacteria. So this is the energy these bacteria require to survive, not necessarily grow. It's well within that range, which is, is shown here. And for a subset of bacteria in very specific conditions, there might be just enough energy for them to, um, to grow in this process too. So again, this is a bit of a fundamental shift. So when you think of bacteria in soil environments, we'd all be thinking of them using um, vegetation and whatnot as the primary energy sources. And this is probably the case for growth. But during persistence, keeping in mind most soil bacteria are in a dormant state, um, many of them are probably getting by just from using these highly dependable trace gases as energy sources. And um, if any of the findings from um, the pure culture stuff I talked about are extendable to um, the ecosystem level, we'd expect that trace gases are especially important in desert environments. And this picture makes it look like I have the most amazing life, but unfortunately most of these um, samples are sent to me. I never actually get to go to these places with a few exceptions. Um, but basically we've looked um, through quite a systematic survey of 20 in hard and cold deserts across the world, how they maintain biodiversity. And the consistent finding is always that phototrophs tend to be in low abundance, very specific niches, whereas trace gas oxidizers are continually abundant and um, active in these sites. And this turns out that there's actually three roles for trace gases in these ecosystems. So one is energy, just like mycobacterium, these desert microbes can use hydrogen and carbon monoxide for aerobic respiration, keep them um, pretty energized. Um, but another role is carbon, um, carbon fixation. So um, we're able to show in certain desert environments um, that hydrogen and carbon monoxide can actually be used to fix carbon um, uh, dioxide um, at, at quite, quite rapid rates. Um, so they're not just generating energy, conserving energy from this, but they're also able to um, produce new carbon from this process as well. But the thing that we just published, um, which again seemed obvious, but we completely missed it, is that metabolic water is also produced from this process. So if you think of a hydrogen powered car, hydrogen oxidation coupled to oxygen reduction, the only exhaust is actually um, water. And this is the same thing for these microbes as well. And actually the amount of metabolic water that they're producing from this process, we're pretty sure it's, it's quantitatively significant. So um, as an example of this, this is work that we've done in Israel. Israel um, has the advantage, unlike Australia, that um, you can drive um, literally just two hours and go from subhumid um, to hyperarid environments. You probably have to drive pretty fast to do that, but um, it's possible. Um, whereas in Australia, you're probably talking about um, a two-day drive to do the equivalent thing. And um, so what we did was go from the subhumid north of the country where you get some vegetation by the way down to the hyperarid south of the country where there's no vegetation at all. And then look at um, basically how the microbes there are living. And we saw that across this aridity gradient, you had this decrease from phototrophs like cyanobacteria um, uh, and then this increase in chemosynthetic bacteria like actinobacteria. And in turn, this is reflected by the activities as well. So if you go, um, um, let's look at the, the soils here. If you go um, across the aridity gradient, you see generally an increasing dependence on carbon fixation with aridity reflecting there's less um, vegetation input, um, but hydronotrophic carbon fixation is much more dominant than um, photosynthetic um, carbon fixation in at least arid and hyperarid soils whereas crust and um, subhumid and semi-arid soils show the opposite trend. So this indicates that there's some sort of inverse relationship between this and that when conditions are particularly tough, these, um, these bacteria that are living on the air can basically um, survive and possibly grow. Um, and Antarctica is um, particularly important in this regard. So I want to give a particular shout out to Linda Ferrari who led this um, really important paper in this space. Um, and in Antarctic soils, we see that 
what were once thought to again be sterile, inactive soils actually guzzle gases incredibly quickly. So this shows the cell specific rates. And whether it's four degrees or minus 20 degrees, these cells are very, very active in these soils at consuming hydrogen to a lesser extent methane, and then a few sites um, to a lesser extent carbon monoxide and a few sites um, methane. And based on um, back of the envelope calculations, the metabolic water that is derived from this process is sufficient to completely rehydrate the cell's entire water uh, within two weeks. So it could be the main way that these cells are actually also avoiding desiccation in these environments too. Um, and so just to summarize all of that, um, so in hyperarid deserts, we think that the main primary producers are actually actinobacteria. We've got other things as well. Um, and obviously they will use organic carbon when it's available, but this is going to be pretty scarce. So instead, um, what they're doing is using these high affinity hydrogenases, and carbon monoxide dehydrogenases to get energy, use that for um, aerobic respiration, but also fix CO2 into biomass using Rubisco. So Rubisco is the key enzyme that does um, carbon fixation in plants, and a variant of this is also found in these microorganisms as well. And this process also generates um, quite a bit of water. Um, we've also observed similar things in the ocean. So um, trace gas oxidizers are highly widespread and active in oceans as well. And um, whereas we see phototrophs that use redops and decrease with depth, trace gas oxidizers actually increase with depth, again, indicating that as conditions get more tough, they become more reliant on these trace gas oxidizers. Um, we've also observed even deep beneath um, thick ice sheets, um, trace gas oxidation is incredibly important as well, together with ammonium um, oxidation and nitrate oxidation. So shifting this view that life is um, primarily driven by photosynthesis is actually, again, very, very complex ecosystems that can get by just on chemical energy sources. And um, I also wanted to mention just a little bit of ongoing work. So we're looking at whether other atmospherically driven ecosystems exist. And so we think that each of these three environments, um, so caves, um, really, really high altitude mountains and um, the atmosphere also potentially dominated by trace gas oxidizers given for various reasons they exclude phototrophs. And we think that in certain environments, whether that be meteorites, um, glacial forefields or mine tailings, um, trace gas oxidizers are probably the first colonizers in these environments before more specialized metabolisms like iron oxidation will kick in as well. But we have yet to prove that, but I just wanted to, to put that out there. Um, so finally, I'm almost done. It'll be about five more minutes. Um, I just want to talk about the astrobiological implications of all of this. Again, keeping in mind that I'm not from this background, and so I'll leave it to you to, to give feedback on how relevant you think all of this is. So the first thing I wanted to emphasize is that exoplanets actually often contain hydrogen and CO-rich atmospheres. Um, so Mars, for instance, has about 0.1% um, CO in its very thin atmosphere, whereas um, this planet, this, um, this, um, the planet surrounding HR 8799, according to this science paper, um, also are full of um, carbon monoxide. And it's also thought that exoplanets with hydrogen-rich atmospheres, just like early Earth, where there was again probably about 0.1 hydrogen present, um, also 0.1% uh, hydrogen present, also exist. So um, obviously, the amount of energy available on these exoplanets actually exceeds the atmospheric um, energy currently on, on Earth. Yet in, on Earth, um, this atmospheric energy is more than enough to sustain life in continental Antarctica. So in my view, um, if the physical conditions are right, it's entirely um, plausible that the energy in, of atmospheres and other environments isn't just um, enabling persistence, but actually probably quite, quite fast growth of microorganisms on, on, uh, on exoplanets. Um, and keeping in mind that life on Earth most likely first evolved on hydrogen. So I'm, I'm very influenced by um, the work of Bill Martin here and his uh, models of abiogenesis. So how life emerged on, on Earth um, suggests that hydrogen was probably the first energy source. In this case, he thinks it's probably geologically rather than atmospherically derived. And um, given hydrothermal chimneys um, tend to be pretty hydrogen rich, that doesn't um, exclude atmospheric origins, but the atmosphere would um, be a little bit less um, favorable for life, but you can't necessarily rule it out. Um, photosynthesis, on the other hand, 
All the evidence suggests it evolved much later and exclusively in, in bacteria. And so um, what, um, what we think originally happened is that cells first oxidize hydrogen using nickel-ion minerals that are still out there like McKenna White. Um, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, and these nickel-ion minerals um, are actually extraordinarily similar to the active sites of uh, nickel-ion hydrogenases today. So we think that first um, energy conservation in cells is first um, dominated by these sort of inorganic chemistry. And then later these um, catalysts became framed with um, protein scaffolds and then became more integrated into respiratory chains as well. And this process has continued to be incredibly useful. So diverse bacteria continue to use variants of this nickel ion hydrogenase, which was found in the last universal common ancestor and to thrive in pretty much every ecosystem imaginable, whether that be oxic or anoxic. And so um, this has had profound influences on our own environments, uh, on our own atmosphere. So hydrogen in our um, atmosphere historically was probably about 0.1% and now it's much, much lower. And this reflects the activities of microorganisms together with some abiotic processes has actually um, greatly reduced these levels as part of this wider shift of the atmosphere from a reducing to an oxidizing one. And even now, these soil bacteria um, are uh, constantly consume about 75% of the hydrogen loss from the atmosphere each year together with a smaller amount, 10% of the carbon monoxide. And this is really important. It mitigates emissions of toxic gases in the case of carbon monoxide, but also indirect greenhouse gas in the case of hydrogen. And amazingly, until Philippe Constant came along in 2008, this process was thought to be strictly abiotic. But now between him and, and my, my own uh, work, we now know what's doing this. We know the microorganisms responsible. We know the enzymes responsible. We, we also have a physiological rationale for this, that hydrogen is this, again, amazing, um, high energy, really dependable um, energy source that allows bacteria to exist in environments that they probably shouldn't be in. So um, in terms of other implications, I think we need to be thinking about planetary protection from all of this. Um, so um, in terms of energy needs, at least, at least from all of my experiences, microbes don't need much to get by. And it's easy for me to, to conceive that if you happen to accidentally, I don't know, launch a rocket from Antarctica and get them onto equatorial Mars, the bacteria that jump along for the, uh, for the ride, could actually end up not necessarily thriving, but continuing to persist in the soils of equatorial Mars by using atmospheric um, carbon monoxide and coupling that to the use of the chlorate, which is all over the soils of, of Mars. And this isn't gonna be an isolated uh, case. There's gonna probably be many, many um, exoplanets where the conditions, at least energetically, are very favorable for life to exist, but obviously there's gonna be other physical um, factors that will be making life um, more, li more or less likely on, on different planets. So um, I guess that's um, me um, done. So just a few take home messages. I'm probably repeating everything I've already said, but just to reinforce things, atmospheric hydrogen and carbon monoxide in my view are fantastic energy sources, given the uh, yield plenty of energy, the ubiquitous and the fusible, and many, many bacteria and, and some archaea can consume these um, trace gases using special enzymes. This process is ecologically widespread, and really biogeochemically important, but it's also actually probably sustaining entire ecosystems like Antarctic ice-free soils. And in turn, this has um, astrobiological implications. So out of LEF, many exoplanets contain um, reduced atmospheres, and this might help to sustain life. So in my view, um, I'm going to put it out there, but it's, it's entirely my view and feel free to disagree, but I think that trace gases, especially of atmospheric origin, are the most plausible energy sources um, for supporting extraterrestrial life. So thanks everyone. And thanks to my team, collaborators, mentors, inspirations, and also these um, funders. And if you want to contact me, these are my uh, contact details. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much, Chris. What a incredible talk and full of incredible insights. Um, well, the floor you. is completely open for questions. Uh, we have about 10 minutes. I have a question. Yeah, go for it, Tom. Yeah, so uh, something I worry about on occasion is the fact that nitrogen and oxygen are in our atmosphere are way out of equilibrium. 
and uh, contain an amount of energy that would dwarf anything that these trace gases would supply. So my question is, well, if, if organisms can use atmospheric gases, why aren't they consuming all the oxygen out of the atmosphere? Um, so, 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 um, just to, just to, um, f fully understand. So, so your, your question is if so, there's. So uh, nitrogen and oxygen out in the atmosphere are totally out of equilibrium and should react yeah. with water to make nitrate. Yeah. If an organism could do that, there would be just an endless source of energy out there in our atmosphere, and they would consume mm -hmm. all the oxygen in, away from us oxygen breathers. So yeah. why is there not an yeah. organism doing that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's, that's a really um, good point. I, I, think, I, I think the reality is that the, uh, I, I might have not, not fully understood, but um, the, with the current levels of, um, trace gases, it's, 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 it's going to be far too low to have a much of an impact, I guess, on, on oxygen levels, but I would imagine it is a significant um, sink of, of oxygen. I mean, in terms of links to, um, not, so, so you're saying nitrogen fixation into nitrates, is that what well, you're you saying? Could just, you could just consume, an organism consume N2 plus O2 plus water makes nitric acid. Mm -hmm. I, I see. So the infinite supply of all of the reactants, and that is highly energetically, it's a highly exergonic reaction. Mm -hmm. well, why does an organism do that? It's strongly inhibited kinetically. Yeah, I think because yeah, of the triple bond, bond of N2. But if, if, I, if, I understand that, if I understand what you're saying correctly, the, the triple bond of N2 would be the big big factor there but um but at the same time um the use of other nitrogen oxides including potentially as energy sources could be could be um could be somewhat relevant so um if i'm not mistaken i think nitric oxide could also be potentially used as an energy source um for um depending on the exact equilibria etc um yeah, so, so, so I hope I haven't misunderstood your question, but I'll say in this case, it's as, um, as um, uh, sorry, I don't know your first name, but the, the, the person in the chat said, uh, the person in the Zoom call said, um, it, it would be a kinetic rather than thermodynamic issue, but, but it, let me know if I've misunderstood. And oxygen in the atmosphere sustained by the burial rate of organic matter is mm -hmm. balancing the photosynthetic production. So it's, it's unrelated. Mm -hmm. Well, none of that would stop an organism from, I mean, it, it, it's all, all of reactions that organisms use are kinetically inhibited. Otherwise, the, organ, the energy wouldn't be there for the energy for the organism to use. But uh, it's, I, I guess it, I, we, we should probably go on, but I, I, don't, I still don't see why an organism couldn't use nitrogen and oxygen from the atmosphere and, and get energy mm -hmm. out of that. Uh, and I've certainly seen that. Theorized before. Sorry, um, sorry to, to interrupt. I've certainly seen that theorized before, and with enough pressure, there might be a way to, uh, as you say, um, um, overcome that, that kinetic hurdle. I, I don't think any organism has yet been discovered that is capable of that, but it's, I've definitely seen it theorized. I think many people have hypothesized that just a triple bond of, of nitrogen makes it just too too much of a challenge the activation energy is too much of a, a barrier um but it's not um it, it's not necessarily impossible i mean microbes have have overcome um various other things but in the case of hydrogen carbon monoxide these these gases are already sufficiently activated if you want to call it that that the activation energy especially if using these hydrogenases is, is um, sufficiently low that um, that it is, it's not much of a hurdle to to, to do this um, to do this reaction. They can do it at minimal over potential, so to speak. But um, but yeah, uh, we we can we can talk more and uh, by any other comments. Thanks a great, thanks a lot. great great talk. Very thought provoking. Thank you, Tom and Dave, for your insights on on the magic oxygen story. It's, uh, it's 
an important one. Um, Jen, I want to make sure you get a chance to ask your questions at the end. Oh, well, we should have students first. <laughs> But let's open it to students, and then if there's no students, we can have the <laughs> now mid-career folks. <laughs> All right. Okay, then I'll then I'll ask. Okay. Um, yeah, I just okay. I had one crazy question. It's in the chat too, but I don't know if you can see the chat. Uh, wonderful talk, first of all. Really, really beautiful. Um, is. Uh, Okay, I'll ask the kind of boring question first. What is the structural basis for discriminating between the low affinity and the high affinity in these enzymes? That's, <laughs> that's an incredibly, it's not a boring question, it's a incredibly <laughs> tough question. Um, so we, we have the structures now and there's um, differences for sure, um, but pinning that down to the exact um, mechanism isn't isn't um it is difficult so the active sites are very very similar the main thing that we see is different is um and whether this is enough we're not sure um is that especially in the hydrogenase the gas diffusion tunnel going into the hydrogenase is incredibly thin in these high affinity hydrogenases meaning they can completely exclude oxygen we believe um uh, but that in turn slows down the um diffusion of hydrogen and potentially makes binding um, a, little, a little higher, um, high affinity, but we observed all sorts of uh, amazing, crazy things in, in these structures, um, like um, L to D amino acid substitutions and other things too. So this could also be, be contributing, but it's, it's a really interesting area. We were hoping that when we got the structures, there would be a modification or something in the active site, and that wasn't, wasn't the case. So it's something much more subtle. Um, mm. but, um, but I see your, your Crazy question. I don't think it's a crazy question. I think it's an amazing question. Is atmospheric methane fertilizing desert microbes? And I would say probably yes, to be honest. Um, we with the methanotrophs, for reasons that we don't fully understand, the distributions are really patchy. We see that in most desert environments, they're not there, but occasionally they'll bloom up to like 10% of the community. And if we literally have must be close to a doubling of atmospheric methane concentrations, that's going to surely provide a massive advantage for, for, for these, these things. But how to fully explore that, I don't know. And it might be good to, to talk offline to see if there's um, ways to actually test this, because I, I think it's a, a beautiful hypothesis, not something I've actually thought about before that, that would be really, really cool to explore. Great. Thank you. Beautiful talk. It looks like someone oh, has you. their hand up. Yes, this is uh, uh, Mark. And that's a kind of a metabolism biology question. I don't know if you'll be able to answer it or not, but is it theoretically possible to have a, an extremophil or a microbial organism that could actually metabolize hydrazine? Um, so by metabolize hydrazine, you mean? Or utilize it in some way, or, or maybe it's an intermediate product as a result of some uh, you know, metabolic reaction using a mox, uh, like ammonia or moxyl. Did, did you say hydrogen, uh, Mark? Or, uh, no, hydrazine. Oh, hi, hi, hydrazine. Yeah, into uh, it. Uh, yeah. Uh, hydrazine, is that? Yeah. Rocket fuel? Um, yeah, so, so um, I don't know much about this, but the person who's done a, some really beautiful work in this space is, is Mike Yetten, and if, if I understand your question correctly, and he showed that um, in Animox bacteria, so ammonium. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I think in this case, it's, yeah, yeah. So, so Jennifer said it in the, the chat too. Um, but in this case, I think hydrogen is primarily an intermediate, but probably some of you will know if they can also grow using hydrazine alone. I, I don't recall anyone looking at aerobic hydrazine oxidation i'm sure probably someone has I, I don't know it wouldn't surprise me if that that's possible too um uh, based on the chemical structure and all of that could uh, if i assume someone's looked at it but if not then it'd be something very fun to look at one day yeah i could only find that one paper like you mentioned there mm -hmm. we'll watch on it <laughs> thanks yeah yeah well, yes. we are at the top of the hour um i don't know i'll be respectful of people's time uh, Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us about your work, a really fascinating presentation. 
and uh, especially because of the time difference uh, willing to speak. Oh, so it's 10 a.m. here. It's not too bad. It's not, not too bad. So I'm very thankful for you being willing to, to move to, to so I didn't have to give a 3 a.m. presentation. So, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> uh, yep, great having pleasure. you. And, uh, let's keep in touch. It's fun. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.